Well, will you please turn in your Bible, if you have one available, to 2 Peter and chapter 1 once more. 2 Peter and chapter 1. I'll read the first four verses once more. To those who have obtained, sorry, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. <clears throat> if you were offered or promised something exceedingly great and precious, how might you respond? If someone were to say to you, I have for you a guarantee of something that is beyond calculation in its worthiness and is valuable to you personally. It is not only worthy in itself, great in itself, but it is precious particularly to you. What we have here offered to us freely is not just something that is valuable, precious or worthy in the eyes of the world, but it is the promise of God. It is offered to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To all those who have the knowledge of God by the glory and virtue of Christ have been given exceedingly great and precious promises. God has looked upon his world in mercy. God has looked upon his people with favour. And God has given these great precious promises. And the promises themselves are great and precious. What God has said to us is glorious and valuable. But it's not just the words themselves. It's not just the offer or the guarantee of them. It's the very thing that is promised. The thing that is held out, the truths that God speaks and the things about which God speaks truth are both precious and great. And Peter is weaving into this opening statement of his second letter the realities that he has in mind. As he speaks of the precious faith that is obtained by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. As he talks about grace and peace multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As he talks about the divine power granting to us everything that has to do with life and godliness. As he talks then about the glory and the virtue that shine in God in Christ Jesus. As he speaks of these exceedingly great and precious promises by which we become partakers of the divine nature and we escape, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What are the promises to which Peter then refers? They are the promises that have to do with the new covenant in Christ Jesus. They are those prophetic words now made more certain. It is the realities that have been promised from the beginning and have now come to light in Christ Jesus by whom life and immortality are brought to light. It is those things that God has crafted, God has established, God has provided in order that we may enjoy real union with him and increasing conformity to him that we might become partakers of the divine nature, 
that we might share something of the character of God in his matchless holiness, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's the life that we have through faith in Jesus Christ, a life that is granted to us, a life by which we become accepted in Christ before God, and a life that we then live out in ways that bring glory and honour to the God of our salvation. And as God's people, as those who have obtained this same precious faith, as Peter and the other apostles, by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we need to lay hold upon these exceedingly great and precious promises. These blessings that God has established, that God has both declared and delivered, in order that we, obtaining them, resting upon them, understanding them, might find from God the refuges that we need and the encouragements upon which we depend to live in the way that God calls us to live. When we are fearful, when we are troubled, when we are weary, when our weakness presses in upon us, when we are assaulted or undermined in our souls, when the church is battered and bruised, when guilt comes upon us, when the shame of our sins washes over us, where and to whom should we turn? These exceedingly great and precious promises are granted to us in order that we might be able to rest upon God. And it, remember, it is not just the promises. It is because they are God's promises. It is God himself speaking, declaring and delivering. God's words about God's works that grant to us what we need in order to hold fast. And it may be that particularly in days like these, when the church of Christ is fragmented and scattered, when there's fear of death because of the way in which the, uh, the news media batters us, when our eyes are being constantly focused upon the things of this world, when perhaps we are ourselves weak and feeble, when we feel that to an unusual degree, when we are isolated from one another, when that lethargy creeps in upon us because it seems like the whole world has in some senses slowed down, or when the weariness comes in against us because it feels like in other respects everything is running at a thousand miles an hour when there is instability and confusion and bewilderment, when we feel at a distance from one another, and perhaps also when we feel at a distance from God, when perhaps we're struggling with sins that we've not struggled with before because we've not been in this situation before, or perhaps because under these circumstances our adversary, the devil, is assaulting us and using these circumstances to open us up to temptations that we've fought, about, fought against for so long, but it feels so hard now to fight against them still. When we don't know what the future holds, when there's a widespread disregard for God and for his word, for his truth and for his people. When the church of Christ is derided and sidelined and, and it's clear it has no real uh, worth or value in the eyes of society at large. Where and to what and to whom can a Christian turn? We need to rest upon the exceedingly great and precious promises of God. Now what is it then about these promises that makes them so exceedingly great and precious? What makes them so valuable to us as we make our way through this wilderness world? The first thing is their beauty and their glory. Their beauty and their glory. It is where they come from and what they contain that make them exceedingly great and precious to God's people. Here is God's provision for us. 
Here is God's supply of all that we need. Remember verse 3, everything that has to do with life and godliness. With not just life in this world, but the life of God. The life that is in God and comes to us in Christ Jesus. That life of the world which is to come. And the godliness that belongs with and to that life. The life of those who are no longer citizens upon earth first and foremost. But who are sojourners here. We are passing through this world. But we belong to the kingdom of God. And the promises that we have. The words that God has spoken to us and the things which God holds out in those words have been crafted by heavenly wisdom. They are altogether lovely. Grace communicates these promises to us. The Lord of heaven has opened his mouth to tell us and his hand to give us the most precious and glorious things that are imaginable. And God's power is at work toward us. Not only wisdom to craft and power to create, but power to bring them to us. Everything that is needful to bring us to Christ, to conform us to the Lord Jesus, and to keep us for the Lord Jesus. So that all that there is that God has done, shining in its beauty, shining in its glory, do we understand what God has accomplished when we read the Bible from beginning to end and see the outworking of God's covenant promises, bringing his people to the Christ whom he will send, keeping us close to him, providing for us to go on with him. These are divine deposits. How would you feel if in the midst of darkness and filth and clutter perhaps you're going through some some box of junk or something and in the midst of it you find some beautifully crafted piece of jewelry and even in the midst of that junk and sometimes because it's in the midst of junk it's craftsmanship it's beauty it's brightness it's quality just springs out at you and it takes almost nothing as you, you hold it up and perhaps you wipe off the sheen of dust across it and it begins to sparkle in the light. Heaven's gifts have been given to God's people by God's own design. And so the promises of God are great and precious, exceedingly so, because of their beauty and their glory as the divine craftsmanship created and brought into being and granted to us from heaven itself. Then God's promises are exceedingly great and precious because of their clarity and their certainty. They are pure and they are clean and they shine most brightly. They are pure with the holiness of God. They are clean with God's divine intent to form a people for his praise. They come to us with clarity. The mystery has been unveiled. You know perhaps how the Apostle Paul sometimes talks about the mystery. The truth that God has made known to us. Those things which before were hidden but now have been made known. And that's what we enjoy. That's what we possess. God's promises to us are not vague and cloudy. They spring off the pages of the book that he has given to us. It is plain to us the great things that God has purposed. And especially now as we look back through the lens of Christ upon all that the Old Testament contains. As we see now with the benefit of hindsight if you will. Some of the things which the prophets beforehand had spoken, not fully grasping all that they were making known. And we see the face of our Saviour lined out in these shadowy declarations of Messiah to come. It doesn't mean that everything is equally obvious to all of us. 
It doesn't mean that there are not still some things which are still difficult for us to grasp. It doesn't mean that we know everything. But it does mean this, that what God has accomplished is well defined and plainly revealed. It is clear and it is glorious in its clarity. And with that clarity comes certainty. Remember what the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 10 and verse 23. He who promised is faithful. We not only know what God has done and is doing. We know that it is true and lasting and sure. Probably get weary in these days. It's a, it's a tragedy really. That authority generally is undermined by dishonesty. We've learned not to trust the people who we ought to be able to trust. And one of the tragedies is that that creeps into the church of Jesus Christ. A manifesto promise is almost a contradiction in terms in modern democracy. By definition, it's empty. Before long, it will be recrafted and retwisted. There'll be delays. There'll be <coughs> redefinitions. It's just not going to be reliable. God does not lie. And there is no spin on God's promises. You do not, as it were, read, read God's manifesto for his kingdom only to discover down the line that you need to redefine what God has said. And you need to take account of the fact that it's not actually going to happen as and when God seemed to be saying that it was. That which God has made clear is also equally certain. It is absolutely reliable because the God who promises is faithful. Not a word of his falls to the ground and so again you've got both the the words that are spoken and the words that are accomplished what God has said is exceedingly great and precious because it has to do with what God has done which is exceedingly great and precious and what God speaks about what God does these things hold together and you can rest your souls upon them the words of God are rock solid and the truths of God's dealings are absolutely sure. And so we have things that are exceedingly great and precious because you have strong assurance about strong substance. The guarantees are absolute. You can truly rest upon this it's as if the most reliable man in the world sold you the most reliable car in the world the car is going to run and run and run and run and when this man tells you that it will run and run and run and run you've got those two things joined together clarity certainty God's Pure, clear speech about God's absolutely accomplished works of mercy. You've got the beauty and the glory. You've got the clarity and the certainty. You've also got the variety and the unity. Variety and unity. And this too is why the promises of God are exceedingly great and precious. Think about the sweet and rich range of new covenant blessings that are promised to us and fulfilled in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's worth remembering here that, that these exceedingly great and precious promises, they're not simply pointing to the future. They're also about the things that are already in our possession, things that are already taking place in the life of God's people how does God call his people to himself how does God accomplish his salvation how does God draw people out of darkness into his light how does he work in the soul 
All this has to do with the exceedingly great and precious promises of God. Illumination. The fact that though by nature your mind is in darkness, you have no natural thought of God, you have no natural appetite for the Lord. But nevertheless, when you hear or read, heard or read the truth of God, you began to understand. It began to grip your soul. You became convinced of your sin and of your misery. You began to appreciate that this world is not all that there is. And still, perhaps, as you go on through this life, as you go on searching the scriptures, God in his mercy continues to peel away the things that would cloud. The veil has been lifted in Christ and still there's illumination and still there is conviction of sin so that perhaps even things that you did not before worry about, things that you never were before concerned over, as you grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you begin to see more and more what sin really is and it becomes more clearly defined and more particular and you see it more distinctly in your life. And here is God in his mercy providing this for you. There is the life itself that comes from Christ Jesus worked by his spirit in the hearts of those who are chosen by God. There's the faith and the repentance that are God's gift so that the first instincts of that new life are to cry to God for mercy putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the promises of grace and of wisdom so that God continues to smile upon you and you are granted from heaven understanding to navigate your way through the challenges of this world. There's the ongoing instruction that comes from the word of God as it proves always and always a light to your feet and a lamp to your path so that you do not miss your way. There's the courage that God gives to God's people so that they are able to stand in the day of trouble. They are able to stand against the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenlies. They are able to stand against the pressures and the insults and the assaults of ungodly men and women in this world. There is the peace of God that passes all understanding. That peace that comes having been justified by faith. So that now we know that God is entirely for us in Christ and is smiling upon us in his son. That having provided for us a way of salvation and having bestowed that upon us. Now the breach between God in his holiness and us in our sinfulness has been closed. And now God accepts us in his beloved son. There is strength for the way. So that by the Spirit's work in our souls, we do not flag. Or if when we do, we are nevertheless enabled once again to turn our eyes to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So that our hands don't hang down and our legs don't become weary. And when everything seems to be against us and when the tide and current of this life threatens to sweep us away. And when our own sin perhaps seems to overwhelm us and when troubles come near to us. Nevertheless there is strength for us from heaven. And there is joy too. And it is so often the joy of the Lord that is our very strength. There is the delight of knowing that we are God's and that God is ours. There is the joy of sins forgiven. There is the delight of knowing that there is a heaven to come. There is the joy of walking with God and delighting in his smile. There is the forgiveness of our sins that fountain open for sin and for uncleanness now ever flowing and overflowing so that not just at the first but again and again when we come to God not pretending that we do not sin but confessing our sins we find an advocate with the Father and there is God upon his throne who is putting away our transgressions because of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. 
Perhaps you might say that the greatest of the promises, the, the one in which all the other promises come together, that the Messiah having come, he has poured out his Holy Spirit upon us. So that all that Christ says about his presence with us, his enduring closeness to us, his communion with us, the fact that he will never leave us or forsake us, the work that he will do in us, the delights that he will bestow upon us, the readiness of our Father in heaven to give all good things to those who know and trust and love him. All of this comes into expression by the inward working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts by whom we are enabled to cry out to God, Abba, Father, because he's the spirit of adoption. He is the one who has taken up residence within us. He is the one by whom we go on, not just having escaped, but continuing to battle against the corruption that is in the world. It is he who is working in us this participation in the character, the nature of God as the Holy God, knowing that the one who is not holy, without holiness, we will not see the Lord. And then there's the promise of the glory to come. The promise that though we do not know what we shall be, yet nevertheless we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. And though some of that may still be, though bright in itself, dim to us, Yet there is this clarity and this certainty that as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we must bear the image of the heavenly man. And all that sweet and rich and full and glorious revelation of what lies ahead for God's people, the kingdom of God, the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells, and the, the glory of a world in which God himself and the Lamb are the light. And all trouble and all turmoil and all sin and all grief and all shame and all distress and all confusion and all oppression. And Satan himself are taken entirely out of the picture. And that having begun that race we shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That we're called then to lay hold upon that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold upon us. That we're straining forward for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Confident that the God who has called us into the way will sustain us along the way. And in all that glorious variety there is this real unity. That all of these blessings are being held together in pursuit of the purpose of God for his people. God has undertaken to bring many sons to glory. God's purpose is that Christ will stand before the Father in the last day and say, here am I and the children whom you have given me. And we will be there because of the divine power that grants us all things that have to do with life and godliness. We will be there through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which glory and virtue have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So that at last, the grand purpose of God shall be realised and the bride of Christ shall stand before Christ as the great bridegroom and she shall be spotless and pure. There shall be no blemish upon her and the design and desire of God in Christ that his people should be with him where he is and should know without any hindrance without any cessation the love of the triune God within themselves, within himself and out towards we ourselves. Can you not say then, must you not say 
but these, because of their variety and unity, are exceedingly great and precious promises. These are those works of divine craftsmanship. This is where the beauty and the glory of God shines forth. This is where you see his grace and his goodness, where his wisdom and his power are demonstrated. These are the promises which were purchased for us in Christ Jesus and by the shedding of his blood. These are the things which do not need to be hunted out in obscure corners of the Bible, but lie readily upon the surface of its glorious pages with their clarity and their certainty shining forth. And so for us they are exceedingly great and precious because of their suitability and sufficiency. Yes, in themselves, beautiful and glorious. Yes, in themselves, clear and certain. Yes, in themselves, both varied and unified in their ultimate purpose and suitable and sufficient for you and for me because they are just the very things that are required to bring sinners like me and you to Christ on earth and in heaven for salvation now and for salvation to come. Whatever we as God's people require for the commencement, the continuation and the completion of our Christian life has already been promised to us by God. Just the precise demonstration of divine power and wisdom, grace and goodness for every stage of our Christian progress, for every circumstance of our Christian life. Brothers and sisters, there will never be a situation in which you find yourself, a circumstance which comes upon you, an assault which rolls against you, a trap that is laid for you, a battle in which you are engaged, in which you will not find some exceedingly great and precious promise for your soul. All that you need for life and for godliness. And you might say, well, some might say this is, this is worthless. This is pointless. That's not what I need. But if you're a child of God, you will say, that's what I need more than anything else. Like Moses, you're willing to part with all the glory and the beauty that this world seems to offer in order for the glory and beauty of what God has accomplished in Christ Jesus. All your real necessities as a child of God are properly supplied in accordance with God's will and purpose. All your proper desires all your proper desires, all your longings for communion with God, all your desires to walk more closely with him, all your appetites for the assurance of salvation, all of these things, God has made provision for you. Therefore, great and precious to an exceeding degree are the things which God has promised. Because nothing that you need in this life and for the next will be withheld as you call upon the name of the Lord. And so finally and by particular way of application, although we've been applying I hope all the way through, these are great and precious promises because of their utility. They are useful to us. These are not just given to, to hang as decorations. They're not given for adornment alone, but for engagement. These are not things that are held beyond our reach. They are granted to us in order that we may have them for ourselves. There's no tantalizing here. There's no teasing. God is not dangling something before our eyes, always out of our reach. 
God doesn't ride us like a donkey with a carrot on a stick always held out beyond our reach so that we're always driven forward by a pursuit of something that we never really possess. These great and precious promises are for us. And so we need, first of all, to learn them. Do you know the promises of God? You might not all know them to the same degree. You might not all understand them with the same clarity. But are you, if you have not learned them, and who can exhaust them, are you at least learning them? From the first promise that God made, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, through all the richness of the Old Testament, shadowing out that which is to come, to the glorious fulfilment of, when all those promises are made yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And then all the, the beauty, all the majesty, all the glory, all the richness, all the sweetness that lies upon the surface of the book of God. Do you make it your goal to trace them out and to gather them up, to study them over? I don't mean you've got to pull down the biggest and thickest book of theological instruction that you've got on your shelf. It's not even a matter of academic attainment. This is not about intellectual capacity. This is about the hungry heart that searches the word of God. And that illuminated by the Holy Spirit. So that our eyes are opened and the book of God is alive to us we trace out the beauties of God's dealings with us and we store them up we hide the word of God in our hearts our appetite is to know and to keep a hold of these things and that's true of of every point upon the scale it may be on the grandest scale the 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 biggest picture imaginable. Or it may be just those little nuggets of truth, those tiny cut gems of divine promise that perhaps in open comparison with the great things that God has done for us might seem relatively insignificant, but when you need them, oh, how precious they are to you. And perhaps there are then, because of your distinct circumstances, your particular situation, your specific temptations or challenges, the particular opportunities that lie before you, the duties that are laid upon you, that you will, as you search the scriptures, you will find those particular promises upon which you can rest. Learn them. And grasp them. Get to grips with covenant reality. Understand. Crying out to God for understanding. What it means for the God of heaven and earth to be your God. Perhaps in this sense the most important thing. And it seems so basic does it not. Is simply to trust what God has said and what God has done. So often it comes down to this. Do you actually believe what God has said? Or is there in your heart still some sinful doubting that God really means what God has said? Some sinful doubting that he really means it for you. Some sinful pride that has concluded that you are beyond God's reach either in terms of what you are or who you are or where you are are you listening to the lie of the devil has God really said and you need to respond yes he has it is here in his word we have the prophetic word confirmed which we do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Simply believe. I plead with you. 
You are one of God's people. Believe what God has said to you, for you and about you. Learn them. Grasp them. Plead them. Pray them. When you are tried and tempted and tested, take God's exceedingly great and precious promises to him. Again, you see the importance of learning them and grasping them because you now need to bring them to God. You need to plead them for yourselves and for others. These are the things that you lay before the Lord and you call upon him who is faithful. And you tell God, as it were, what you know of his character, what you know of his nature, what you know of his works and of his words. And you wrestle with God as the saints do in the scriptures. As you see in some of those glorious prayers of the Old Testament that have been recorded for us. And the pleadings of the New Testament which come from the hearts and the pens of apostles and prophets. God has spoken and we expect that God will do what he has said. God is not like some of those parcel delivery firms. I don't know if you have the same sinking feeling as I do when you place an order for something and the, the letter comes through. We've sent it with such and such. A, you know, oh, that's never going to arrive. That's just not going to happen, is it? God's promises always arrive. God's word is sure. And we need to believe that and to expect that. And so we will send our requests up to God. We will make known the desires of our heart with a confidence that the God who has promised is faithful. And then we will, learning them, grasping them, pleading them, we will properly use them. We will live in the light of them. Have you done that, first of all, by coming to the Christ of the Scriptures? Have you done that, first of all, by believing what God has said about his Son, Jesus Christ? By a sweet and restful confidence in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world, the first use that any sinner must make of the promises of God, as God by his spirit begins to work in the soul, is to come to Christ. You know how so often in the scriptures, the writers of these pages simply remind us of the facts of God's saving accomplishments. Christ Jesus born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. You know, says the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, you know the very substance of my gospel. Christ Jesus came, Christ Jesus lived, Christ Jesus died, Christ Jesus rose again from the dead and saves all who trust in him. The first response of your heart to the great and precious promises of God must be faith in Christ Jesus and then having trusted to go on trusting to trust him now and always to trust him as you battle against remaining sin that you may become increasingly a partaker of the divine nature that your life might be marked more and more by the pursuit of and the attainment of holiness in the fear of the Lord. That because of God's exceedingly great and precious promises, you will head heavenwards with your heart and your eye fixed upon the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The men and the women who have learned and grasped and pleaded the exceedingly great and precious promises of God are heavenly minded people. Their lives are characterized by faith and by hope and by love. Not perfectly, but truly and increasingly. 
My friends, if you and I say that God is true, if you and I believe that God has bestowed upon us in his power, his wisdom, his grace and his goodness, these exceedingly great and precious promises, if you and I sincerely believe that God has provided everything that has to do with life and godliness by his glory and virtue, then should we not live in the light of these things? And careless of the world's opinion, press toward the prize. May God then in his mercy grant to us that we may know, not just intellectually, not just affectionately, but from the very depths of our souls, that our wills may be bound to these things that we may hold fast to the exceedingly great and precious promises of God and trade on them and invest in them and receive them, delight in them, putting sin to death, pursuing holiness in the fear of the Lord and marching together toward the glory which is to come, that we must reach because of the exceedingly great and precious promises of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ.